deed has been hidden. Parts of it have been changed, usually for the reasons of men, and we're all looking for truth. And indeed, after we look at all the evidence that's going to be presented this morning, if indeed Jesus did survive the cross, does this really take anything away from him? I don't think so. I don't. I think it actually adds knowing the truth about the man and what he brought to the world I think is enhanced. Nothing is taken away. And uh, I hope that we'll all look at this next combined presentation in that light. Wendell Stevens. I, I, I don't have words t really to tell people about Wendell Stevens. I think that he is the greatest single asset that we have in this UFO and paranormal community. He is a founding director of this Congress, and in truth, without Wendell's support and without his foundation stone at the inception of this uh, organization, it, it wouldn't be here for all of us. And I've said this before, I will say it again to you guys, and it's from my heart. I think Wendell has forgotten more than I'll ever know. And uh, we're so blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, Wendell Stevens. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, folks. Uh, it's nice to see so many of you back again. I'm going to show you this book first. This just came out. It's an English translation of Guido Moosbrugger's second book. It's on the table back there. Michael Whalen has them. Michael Whalen is one of the members of the U.S. FIGU, and they're putting this out. So get that out of the way now. I want, I'm not going to use the script this morning. I'm going to tell you about some things that happened to us that uh, assured our credibility, mine at least, of the case, because I started out like everybody else. If uh, the pictures are too good to be true, uh, is this really happening? And you know, I speak on other aspects of the UFO phenomena around the country, and frequently I get a question, almost every time, a question, do you really believe in this Meyer case? And I'm here to tell you that I really do believe in it. And I was as much of a skeptic as anybody to begin with because that's my business. I'm not a skeptical advocate, but I had my problems. Now, let me characterize Mr. Meyer for you as I understood him. When, when I first got there uh, and met Mr. Meyer, I sat down in his kitchen. They welcomed us right in, and I stepped, sat down in the kitchen across the table from him. And I went there with Ilse von Jacobi. She was a German-English translator. She was a, a, a multilingual journalist in Germany. He wrote for Blick magazine and Il Tempo in Italy and several others. And she had gone to visit Mr. Meyer from, the, from Karl Weitz organization, UFO Nachrichten, that means UFO News, published out of Wiesbaden, Germany. She was also a key member of that group. And the one before her, the only other UFO investigator before her was Lou Zinstag, who was a niece of Carl Jung. She was the first, one of the first UFO researchers and investigators in, in Europe. She had one of the first UFO groups. She published the first UFO journal in any language in Europe, and it was published in German out of Basel. She was Carl Jung's niece, and he used her as a sounding board for his examination, uh, his own examinations of the UFO phenomena. And she had a lot of consultation with him. And she told me one time, sitting in her apartment there in Basel, she said, you know, he was uh, working with, since he had a sister, a younger sister, 
who was a voice channel that he communicated with regularly, the discarnate voice through his younger sister from which he developed many of his ideas. Now, I never knew that before. And uh, I don't think the world knows much about that. But anyway, when I went to Switzerland the first time, everybody told me that I would need a translator because Meyer didn't speak English. So I persuaded Nils von Jacobi to go down there with me. And uh, we arrived at the house and sat down across from him. And I looked at my translator and I said, I am very pleased to meet you, Mr. Meyer. I, I would like to ask you some very pointed questions. Do you mind? He says, if you speak slowly, and he says, no, I don't mind. And if you speak slowly, I can understand. And I looked at my translator and her mouth was open and her eyes were big. And she says, but he doesn't speak English. So I said, how long have you been speaking English? He says, oh, I speak a little. And uh, so we, we just talked in English after that. And when he got stuck, the translator would interject. Now, let me characterize the man for you that was sitting across from the table from me. He was a very sincere looking man. He was simple. He had one arm missing. His uh, left arm, I believe it was. Uh, he had very clear, sharp eyes. He was the kind of a guy, when you asked him a question, you looked him in the eyes, he didn't look away. He looked right into your soul. And he answered directly. He didn't hedge. He didn't run around the bush. He answered the questions very directly and very pointedly. He invited me to, to stay and gave me a bed in the house where they lived. He, uh, I learned from living with him that he was a, he was a kind of a fellow that a lie was a great sin to him. He, he would take a beating or to anything to avoid a lie. He always told the truth, he answered directly, he never looked away. He was never devious in any respect. He told me that he considered himself an anti-materialist. And I saw that in practice because he never carried any money with him. He, uh, other people carried the money, but he didn't like to touch money for one thing. He didn't like possessions. He didn't own anything but his little moped that had, he had gotten from somebody else. I think it had been given to him. And uh, he was very direct in answering everything. He, 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 he didn't, he, he wasn't devious in any way. So we became pretty close personal friends. And because of our close association and, and working together, we learned to communicate pretty well. He learned a lot more English than I ever learned German. But he was, uh, he was a very practical man. He he was the kind of guy that was busy all the time. If you, if you weren't with him when he was busy, you didn't get to talk to him. If he was, well, for example, I got up one morning, had coffee, and, and I was trying to talk to him. He motion for me to come on. We went out and got on a, 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 a wagon, a farm wagon. Went down to some farm where some farmer had donated a load of manure for their garden. And he got off, and here's this guy with one arm could pitch a full shelf pitchfork full of manure onto the wagon and he pitched it off again along with the other men that were using two arms and I was using two arms. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> as a kind of aside from that, when Shirley McLean went to visit him, he wasn't particularly impressed by anybody. And she was trying to talk to him and he'd get up and go to do things that he had to do and then come back and talk for a bit and then do something else and she was getting pretty exasperated. <laughs> and she wanted a whole day with him and uh, the next morning they got up, they're getting ready to go to work, it's very similar to my experience, and uh, she's trying to talk to him and the men start going out, he says, I've got to go, you may come if you like. So she went with him and they got on the same wagon and went and hauled another load of manure and Shirley McLean pitched it <laughs> on and off along with everybody else and when he, found, when he saw that, he started talking to her. Then he would sit down and talk to her in the evening after all the work was done and, and, and they had dinner and everything and, and she talked to him. Uh, quite a bit at length. Now, Shirley MacLaine is probably the world's expert on extraterrestrial visits from the Pleiades. She has been to every Pleiadian contactee, and each of the Pleiadian contacts is different from the others. They're, they're not all coming from the same place. 
but she has been to all, there's about nine, and she's been to them all and spent days with them getting their story and their information. So when she heard that this case involved Pleiadians, she immediately wanted to go look him in the eye. She bought our tickets. We went over with her. And she, she lived with him also in the house for a week and talked to him while they were working and talked to him uh, in the evenings when everything else was settled. So there was a remote possibility we could have had here, her here on the stage with me today, but that fell apart at the last minute because of transportation problems. And uh, also Lee Elders was going to be here, him and his wife. Uh, they're the people that I brought in to the investigation with me. And, and I'll tell you why. I was already investigating UFO cases, and I was good friends of Jim and Coral Lorenzen, the founders of AFRO. AFRO, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, is the oldest civilian UFO research in the organization world. It was the first real civilian UFO research organization in the world. Jim and Coral founded it when NICAP came into being advertising itself as the civilian research organization, but when we learned that the founders were all retired CIA officers and that NICAP was created to take, uh, to get information that experiencers would not divulge to government investigators, then we knew that UFO was the only one that was truly, truly doing this. and. There were a number of spin-offs after that. There were a whole bunch of uh, private organizations that sprung up. But they were the first and the oldest and the longest. Uh, anyway, I, I took my information that I was learning back to Afro. I frequently discussed it with Jim and Coral Lorenzen. But they took a negative stand in the very beginning, and I'll tell you why. And all the other UFO groups followed them, followed their cue. When, shortly after Meyer's contacts began, Lou Zinstag again, the journalist, multilingual journalist in Basel, in her backyard, she went to visit him. She took Timothy Good with her, a young guy that now has become well known as a UFO researcher in his own right in England. But he was, he was a kind of a protege of Lou Zinstag, and she took him to the Swiss farm, and they went to meet Mr. Meyer. She had a similar experience to mine. She thought he was very sincere. She thought that his what he was describing was really happening to him. She had plenty of evidence of that. She had talked to other witnesses. She looked at some of the contact sites. She looked at the photographs. She even brought some photographs with her when she came to see me. But after visiting him a couple of times, she had some of these remarkable pictures he had taken. And I had been exchanging pictures with Lou Zinstag for some time already, and she called me after she had got home from her first visit she said, I've got something really interesting that I want to show you. And she said, I'm going to be in the United States next month. I'm coming to do some more research on the Adamski case. Tim and I are writing a book about George Adamski. And he was an old friend of mine, and we want to go back to his home and, and look at some records. So she said, if you'll uh, pick us up at the bus station when we get in, we'd be happy to come by and show you what I'm hearing. Well, Lee and Brett Elders happened to be sitting in my living room. They came down to visit me that weekend, and they were there when I got the call from the bus station to go down and pick up Lou Zinstag and, and her, her friends, which I did, brought them out to the house. And right after we got there, she opened her purse. She said, I want to show you something. And she pulled out an envelope with 12 pictures in it. And she handed me the envelope, and I opened them up, and I looked in, and there were 12 of the Meyer photographs, beautiful photographs too good to be true, what I thought and everybody else thought. And I said, do you really think this case is happening? And she says, well, she says, I'm pretty sure that it's happening, but she says, I, I don't like it. And I said, well, what's wrong with it? She said, well, she said, they don't have a Jesus Christ. And uh, she was a born-again Christian. She had asked Meyer about uh, what they knew of Jesus Christ. and. Uh, he didn't give her an answer that she liked. And uh, so she, she was of the opinion that the case was, legi was legitimate, but it was coming from the other side. So she did divorced herself from investigating the case and 
that's about the time that I moved into the case and found out that Ilse von Jacob was from Jewish uh, UFO Nachrichten out of Wiesbaden was also investigating the case and I teamed up with Ilse von Jacobi because she spoke this German fluently and English too. So I looked at the pictures in my house and I wanted to have a copy the worst way. She said, I can't give you any copies. Can't allow you to copy them. And after a whole afternoon of arguing, <laughs> it was five o'clock or 5.30 in the afternoon and she said, well, I'll let you shoot a copy of a couple. Well, shooting meant taking my camera and trying to shoot a copy of the picture that she's holding. And we're doing it in poor light in the afternoon because the sun is down. I have only the light through the window to do it. No proper close-up lenses or anything else. But I did have an image I could look at. And the more I looked at it, the more curious I became. And uh, so I decided I was going to have to go to Switzerland and look Mr. Meyer in the eye myself and see what Lou Zinstag had seen, see what Ilse von Jacobi had seen, and uh, I bought a ticket on Laker and went over there. After, by the time I'd gone there the third time, my friend Lee Elders and his uh, partner in, in Intercept, Tom Welch, were in London sweeping a big bank system. And on that third visit, when I, I intended to stay two weeks living in Meyer's house again, I had persuaded him to take me back to all of the photographic sites. That was what I was most interested in, was the photographs. So he took me to each one in turn, and we walked over the site. He parked his moped where he had parked it before. He walked over it when they showed me the positions he took when he took the pictures, where he was standing, where the ship was, and everything else. And at that point, during those visits to the photographic sites, I, was, I became pretty much convinced that he could not have faked the pictures because there was no way he could suspend an image into the scene in front of us because in most cases he was on the shoulder of a hill that rolled down steeply away from him and it was 10 miles across the valley up the other side. Nothing to string wires to, nothing, no way to loft a, a, a model into the picture and photograph it because the guy that was throwing it would have to be in the picture because of the, the view to the sides of each of the images. And so I called, or Lee Elders in, in, in Zurich called me in, in my guest house in Switzerland and asked me how, how I was doing. I said, oh, you've got to come over here. I'll pay for your ticket. Just come on over. I want, I want you to see what I'm seeing. So him and Tom showed up the following day and Meyer took us around to all of them again and they agreed that these things were, these pictures would have been impossible for anybody to fake, even with a big team of experts that couldn't have done it. And that's how they became involved in the, the, inv the investigation with me. Now, there was another thing. Afro was interested in what I was doing, but when Lou Zinstag came into town, she had called me and made arrangements with me. I picked her up at the railroad station, at the bus station, brought her to my house. She said, uh, I'd like to make a courtesy call on Jim and Coral Lorenz, and I correspond with them regularly. I said, fine, let's call them and invite them to, di to dinner. And we'll go down to some place down the hotel and have a nice dinner. So we did, and, and they accepted in the afternoon. And then at 6 o'clock, when we were going to meet at the restaurant, and Jim and Coral were going to meet us there too, Jim showed up alone. And he said, Coral's not feeling too well. I She's not going to come. So we, we went in and sat down at the table, and we were starting to order our dinner when the phone rang, and the waiter brought the telephone to Lorenz and handed it to him. He listened for a few minutes. He says, uh, I'm going to have to go. The dog is sick. And uh, I knew, because I'd known him for some time, that this was Coral's order for him to get home immediately. She was a heavy drinker and by five or six o'clock in the afternoon she was uh, fairly intoxicated and that was uh, she was always threatening Jim to do something to the dog if he left her sight during those times because she wanted him there. So he left and, and he never did get to hear about the, the Meyer case at all. He left before the conversation even got started. He never saw the pictures or anything. 
And they left the next day to go on to Vista, California to Adamski's old home to uh, continue their investigation. And I took the poor copies that I had shot with the images small in the middle of my pictures, showed them to them and told them what they said about it. They said, well, keep us informed. So I did, but uh, the next day when, or when Carl saw the pictures and heard the, about the case, she took the position that I had stole Afro's case. That they considered me a member of Afro, but I've never been a member of any UFO organization because I never felt like I agreed entirely with the, what they were doing or what they thought. There was a lot of backbiting going on. I didn't like that. So even though the Lorenzans tried to give me membership cards a number of times, I always returned them, and most of the others that I received. And so uh, now that the case is becoming quite exciting, Coral took the position that I had stolen Afro's case and that I was a traitor and a renegade, and they took my keys to the office away, and they took my keys to the files away, locked the doors, and kept me out, told me not to come back. And then the Lo Lo Coral was the chief uh, communicator in Afro, and she did most of the writing. She wrote the, the bulletin, she wrote the editorial, she, she was the one that set policy at Afro, and she told others that she talked to that she thought the case was a fraud, that uh, it, uh, I, was, I had managed to get the case, that I probably couldn't handle it, that uh, it really was their case and things like that. Now, my problem when I got the case, I would gladly have taken Afro in with me, except they didn't have any money. They didn't have any way to send anybody over there with me. I would have had to pay for them. And they didn't have any way to send anybody else over there with me. And this was true of, of MUFON, which was a baby organization back in Wisconsin at the time. Uh, nobody had money in, in their accounts that could send an investigator to Switzerland. I was going on my own money. So they, since they couldn't send somebody else and they, they couldn't get into it, so to speak, uh, they began attacking the case and everybody else followed suit. Now MUFON had some correspondence in Germany and about the sixth or seventh time I was there, the, a German showed up at the at the property there, Myers property in Switzerland, gave him a MUFON identification card, said he was there to investigate the case for MUFON, and uh, they, the ladies came in and told, we, I was in the house at the time, they came and told us there's a MUFON investigator out there, what should we do? I said, well, answer his questions, show him some pictures, he'll go on his way, he doesn't have much metal on, he's probably a businessman, or he's work at, work, this is weekend, he works for the week, He's going to have to be back for work Monday morning. He's not going to stay long. Just treat him as best you can. So they left that fellow alone on the patio with the, the three albums. By now we put the pictures in the plastic albums. And when the ladies got up and went inside to do other things, he'd take his camera out and snap pictures, copy pictures, uh, Myers pictures, through the pocket of the album, through the plastic in the album. And those are the pictures that MUFON sent to Bill Spaulding at Brown Saucer Watch in Phoenix, who had a reputation at the time for analyzing UFO photographs by computer. And uh, he published the report and gave Afro a report, which they published, and then MUFON published, or MUFON, maybe the other way around, alleging that the pictures were all of a 12 to 18 inch model suspended from a line that they were all fakes. And MUFON published the report of the fakes, AFRO published the report, Every, all of the other UFO organizations copied from those reports. Now, we were working with the original slide transparencies. Meyer took all of his pictures on slide transparencies, positive slide transparencies, ASA 100 speed, all at a setting of one 125th of a second, F11, because his camera would, had been dropped and broken and the focus ring was jammed, the, the setting rings were jammed, he couldn't change the settings on his camera anyway. All he did was put film in, snap pictures, and take it out and have it developed. So we were looking at the original slide transparencies. In fact, with Mr. Meyer, we went to 
good photo laboratories in downtown Zurich, and there are some, some excellent photo technicians in Switzerland, some of the best. And we had to make, I had to make enlargements from the original slide transparency, 16 by 20 inches. That's an enlargement about that size. And we never saw any evidence of suspension lines in any of those. Of course, we didn't give those to DSW, we didn't give them to APRO, and we didn't give them to MUFON. And uh, so we also went to, did some other things. We found that in Basel, in Luzinstag, hometown, there was a new Hell Chromograph laser scanner. Hell Chromograph 300 was one of the early ones. Argon laser scanner, and it, this was a, one of the first machines that could scan the slide transparencies and make four separate color separation negatives, uh, one red, green, and blue, and black and white, black. And we took one of the slides there and, and let them color separate it into uh, plates to print posters, 18 by 24 inch posters. And so the negatives are 18 by 24 when they come out of the Hell Chromograph scanner. And uh, the posters were printed back at 200 dots per inch, which is normal poster size, but uh, it, it's still like a newspaper picture. It's a bunch of dots run together. But I'm going to come up to that a little later. Let me show you some slides here. If you'll turn the slides on for me. Can I carry this? It's a remote. I can carry it around. Okay. And... Uh, I'll kind of take some cues from this as we go if you want to bring the lights down a little bit so they can see. This first picture is of Mr. Meyer. Can you adjust the camera back there so the bottom comes down a little and we can see the top? There are going to be other slides, but yeah. This is uh, what Mr. Meyer looked like when I first met him. He was a security guard on a property in Hinwell. Uh, the, it was for an absentee landlord. He was supposed to be protecting their property for them. Uh, you got something to fix it? Okay. And uh, this is his family that I first met. Here's little Methuselah right down there. You met him a year ago when he was here. But that was, oh, where's, where's my camera rece receiver? Back here? Okay. There is a whole book that we never even got into that developed before Meyer's contact with the Palladium. His contacts actually began when he was about five years old, and it continued after his first uh, probable contact with these aliens was when he was an infant, and he was dying of pneumonia, and the doctor had told the family that he wouldn't live till morning, and uh, the parents were sitting up with him. They all dozed off, and when they woke up about dawn, the baby was well, and that was Meyer. The, somebody had intervened, and... He was completely well. But after that, he had experiences. At the age of eight, he was contacted by a being that landed in a goldish pear-shaped vehicle that put uh, a helmet over his head, and, uh, and he inculcated information in his mind. And then after that, when he was a, a young man in his late 20s, his contact began with a... Uh, Another woman that identified herself as Asket, she said she came from the Dahl universe, which she described as a, an equal and opposite universe to ours, that ours exists because theirs exists, theirs exists because ours do. And the Dahls had learned to cross, to cross the barrier between the two universes, and they were now interacting with Mr. Meyer and giving him a lot of history of our planet and showed him... Uh, for instance, they showed him atomic bomb sites from thousands of years ago. We think we just invented the atomic bomb now, but uh, the dead val uh, out here in California, uh, the what is it, Dead Valley, Death Valley, Death Valley. Death Valley out there is one of the ancient atomic bomb sites. That's why not a whole lot of stuff grows there. Well, anyway, those contacts were quite remarkable, and Meyer had a camera then too. He was a able man. He had both arms. And he took a lot of pictures. He took over 300 pictures of the Dahl spacecraft during those years from about 1955 to uh, 
1864, and here is one taken over the Ashoka Ashram at Merauli, India. Two bright lights in the sky. Here's a picture that was taken over the ashram also that shows uh, a number of lights in the sky. Also, doll craft, doll vehicles, the formation of them. He took another picture. I need to back up. There was a couple other pictures taken this same day that didn't have any foreground in them that uh, were published in the New Delhi News for the following morning. He was at a railroad station, and this may be at the railroad station. He was at the railroad station, and there were hundreds of people waiting to get on the train, and he was too, when these appeared overhead, and they began gyrating around, and he started taking pictures. He finished his roll of film, took about 12 pictures of these objects in the air over the station, and when the news reporters arrived, they're gone, but people in the crowd pointed out Mr. Meyer, along with a couple others that had cameras as having taken pictures, and they came to Meyer. He described what he had seen, told them he had pictures in the camera, it was still in the camera. They wanted to print the pictures the next day, so Meyer gave them the camera so they could take it to the laboratory and take the film out themselves, develop it, and they printed the pictures like this on the front page of the New Delhi News, and then they sent the camera and the negatives and copy prints back to Mr. Meyer at the ashram at Morali. And that was pretty much the beginning of his photographic events taking place in India, and that those contacts went on for 10 years. And then they stopped in 1964, and they did not resume with the Palladians until 1975, 11 years. So here's another picture taken that's just of a bright sun in the sky. The real sun is higher up at uh, the ashram also, near the ashram. Here's another picture taken over the ashram. There's five blue lights in the sky. There's a fifth or four of them. The fourth one's down there. But there's a whole story associated with these contacts that would have filled two more books, like the Palladian contacts, and they went on for 10 years. Here's a large watermelon-shaped ship, a, a shaped light in the sky, huge. See the size of the tree down here in the foreground? And this, uh, this light is in the sky over it. Meyer snapped that one. Next. Okay. Here's one. Now let's see if I can find the ship in this picture here. Here it is. This is a doll sh ship. It's uh, one that Ascot flew, but they, the dolls also had a number of special purpose vehicles, all different from each other. And they were used for different purposes. And Ascot flew several of them, but there were other pilots that flew others of those ships. I think we have one more. There was two in this, there's another picture taken in sequence behind the one down here. Then we had this picture, uh, again, like the one over the railroad station, but this is over the uh, Ashoka Ashram in India. And uh, here's another picture. Now this is a, a tower, a building at the ashram, Meroli Ashram, and the, the object, this is Sanyasi's ship, and she's in it at this point. And she is in touch with Meyer on the ground. And it's flying from right to left through the scene. And here's the next picture in the sequence. Down there, it swooped down and was going up. Now, w we were going to have Phobal Chang, who is the Cambodian representative to the United Nations, or she was until a couple of years ago when she retired, who was the 10-year-old girl living in the ashram with her grandfather, who was the head of the ashram, and her eight-year-old brother, and they followed Mr. Meyer around because he had a monkey that he called Emperor Hanuman. And the monkey could do interesting tricks and Meyer would let the little boy make the monkey do tricks. So they were always following Meyer around and the little girl too. And she knew about the visitors. They knew about the, the doll visitors. She watched Meyer take pictures on a couple of occasions and one time she was washing clothes in a ditch near the ashram there, or it ran through the ashram, when he snapped a picture of a doll ship in the sky with Phobo Shang washing her clothes in the ditch in the foreground. So she was going to be here also, so I could introduce her to you once again. She was here two years ago, and let you tell some things that she knew about Mr. Meyer personally, but uh, 
because of the airline problem, she can't make it. This is one of the first pictures taken by Mr. Meyer on the 25th of January of 1975. And in thi at this point, Meyer has had no contact for 10 years, almost 11 years. And uh, he was, it, had, was in the habit of going to a metaphysical discussion group in Hinwell, headed by a man called uh, Hans Jakob. Hans Jakob was a local attorney. He was a real estate salesman. He was a businessman in town there, well known. And he was holding discussion groups in his home on Friday evenings, several weeks a month. And Meyer had gone to one of those meetings where they were reviewing the, uh, the, 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 the studies of Jurgen and somebody else. They had published a book on how they were capturing voices in a still room with a tape recorder. And Meyer decided to try it himself. He borrowed a tape recorder from somebody, set it up in a bedroom, started it, closed the door, and left it for an hour, and then went back and checked it. He didn't, he didn't get anything on the tape, and he re-rolled it, rewound it, and set it up again to give it another try. And the next time he read it, there was a soft voice on the tape that said, Billy, take your camera and go outside. I played it back several times to be sure he'd heard it. Then he shut the tape recorder off, went and got his camera, and went outside. He got outside and it's his his own front yard there and he his moped is standing there and he straddles the moped and kicked the stand away, and started it up and just started riding. He just kind of followed his nose. It led him he didn't know where he was going, he was just going. And it led him out of town and out into the Freck Nature Preserve which is a forested area there. <coughs> and uh, he stopped the moped, put the kickstand down, and was just sitting there when he heard a humming sound, a humming, swishing sound in the sky. And looking up, he saw a silvery object that came out of a cloud and looped back and went into the cloud again. The sound stopped, and he thought that was it. But then a few minutes later, the sound started up again. It came back out. This time, it circled back came in low over the trees as you see here and began a landing approach at this point. Here's the second picture. Actually, that's uh, after the landing and a woman got out and walked towards him. Now, when the ship landed, he was surprised enough and he was trying to get closer to you, taking three pictures with his camera. He was trying to get up closer to get better pictures and he was running towards the landed ship and the closer he got, the more force he was running into. He said it felt like wading against a strong current in a river. It was just, the closer he got, the stronger the force got until he couldn't make any headway against it and just sat down on the ground to see what was going to happen. And at that point, this figure came out from behind the ship and walked up to him. That was Semyasi. And she told him that uh, she was there to give him some information. And she sat down on the grass with him and she said, now, listen very carefully because what I have to say, you, we want you to get very accurate and we want you to, to publish it. She said, how will I do that? I have no paper, no pencil, and no recorder. She said, I'll help you remember. And she told him about the damage to the ionosphere, the destruction of the ionosphere, and told him that we had already lost something like 6% of our ionosphere, and by their projections, in another 10 years, we would lose another 10 or 15%. And it was on an ever-increasing scale, and that this would cause serious problems for life on the planet, and that he should get in touch with his government and, <coughs> and make them aware of the problem. And he wondered, how am I going to do that? And she said, you'll find a way. So anyway, he didn't have anything to record, and uh, he listened to her, and after 20 minutes of discussion with her, she got back in the ship and took off. When he got home, it, this is after the discussion, she's taken off now. This is about the fifth picture taken at that time, and there's another one here where she has circled around and come back. There's a fire, a, 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 a 
lumber truck parked on the scene down here. Another picture showed the lumber truck. And this day came, came in close, hovered slowly, and then zoop, zoomed off and disappeared. But that was the first experience with the, with the Pleiades, with Samyasi and her team. And these are the very first pictures taken as the first photo sequence. The next photo sequence was taken on, uh, at J Jacobsburg Allenburg on the 27th of February. The first one was the 25th of January. That's a month later. And he took some more pictures of what seemed to be the same ship. And uh, the, the, there were more contacts. In the meantime, she had, he had had several face-to-face -face meetings with her at rendezvous points on the ground. And he made his contact notes. And then uh, she invited him to take his camera for another demonstration, is what they call it. She called it a flight demonstration. Now, he didn't take his camera every time he went to a, a contact. He only took the camera when they invited him to do so because he thought, first of all, he didn't have any money and he didn't have a lot of film and he didn't want to waste anything. And second, the camera didn't work too good, but it was the only camera that he could work with one hand. And uh, so he's had several contacts up to this second flight demonstration and he took his camera and he took a number of pictures. There were two sequences that day, one about 10.30 in the morning and one in the late afternoon. Now, I believe this is from the one in the late afternoon, but here is the one in the morning showing four ships came in together this time. Now, he's seen the ships all these times, but he hadn't been taking pictures of them because he didn't, didn't carry his camera. But now, they showed up with uh, four ships. There are two variation. Uh, this is a variation number one. This is variation number two. And there's these two remote controlled drones. Those remote controlled drones were about half the diameter of the bigger ones. And they had one pilot's position aboard and one extra seat. They could, could only carry two people, whereas the larger ones here could carry up to nine people aboard. And they were often, they always had three aboard. So this day, they demonstrated four of them in flight together, and he got a whole roll of pictures of those four in flight. Uh, in that case, though, there were so many of them that he was getting as many as he could in the picture. Always one or more were chopped off on the edges, and that led, which leading to the argument that they were chopped off because somebody is holding them into the picture and they didn't want you to see the hand. That was what Brown Saucer Watch said. So later in the same day, in the afternoon, they came back with one of the craft here, a variation two, variation one is gone and the two drones are gone. And they took pictures of it flying around in the, in the, in the dusk of that afternoon and some haze in the sky. These are a variation number two. This is a picture, that's what I looked like uh, back then when we were doing this in 77 and 78. But I, I had hired translations of the first contact notes and I had been in the living room with Meyer trying to get make corrections to the translations. And we'd been working from the time we, from after dinner till about 10.30 at night. He said, I gotta go out and have a smoke. I said, okay, we'll go outside. And this is an old car seat. The, the door coming out of the lean-to shelter is right over there behind Janichi Yaoi from Japan, Nippon Television in Japan. We had brought them there to do a, a video documentary on the Meyer case at the time. They requested it and we allowed it and, and uh, Meyer approved it, the Palladians approved it. They also approved our, what we were doing there, but they didn't approve what a lot of other people came to do. So we sat down like this uh, in the car seat, out just outside of the door, and as I sat down, Meyer was pulled across my lap suddenly like that, <coughs> down like that, and he started to get up and down again. I said, what's the matter, Bill? Are you having a heart attack? But in the meantime, we felt debris from above us here falling in our hair. Then we heard a, a shot. We heard the re retort of the shot. He said, that was a shot. And I said, yeah, it sure sounded like it. And he looked around but after he sat up, and here behind his head is a hole in the wall, a, 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 a pockmark in the wall where a bullet, a dumb, dumb bullet too, a soft bullet designed to spread out when it hits tissue, had been fired at him from the garden about 800, 900 feet in front of us. And we got down on our hands and knees and crawled around into the house. We, we pulled the, he insisted on pulling the seat out to see where the bullet was because the hole's behind his head. 
and it's laying right there behind the seat. He picked it up, and he said, it's still hot. He handed it to me. And then we went inside and got flashlights and came out to look for whoever did the shooting. That was the uh, 11th assassination attempt, by the way. This picture is taken at... Uh, Let me get caught up here in my cards. Taken at uh, Oberzeld. Oberzeld simply means above the town of Zeld. Obersadlig is above the town of Sadlig. And where you have Fuchsbuhl Hochhalden hyphenated, that's between Fuchsbuhl and Hochhalden. So these two crafts, he, he was it, 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 he was told he could bring his camera this day. This was to be a demonstration of a variation number one, the first craft that he encountered, being returned someplace, and it's, it's going out of service. It's been in use for 300 years, and it's being escorted by one of those drones that they're going to use to come back in when they leave the variation number one ship, when they, when they deliver it. And if you'll notice, this was really a beautiful picture. Here's buildings in the foreground, the skyline, you can see the sun being reflected. It's not behind the, the drone. It's being reflected off the side of the drone. The upper ship is not tilted at quite the right angle for it, but it's one of the prettiest pictures we have. And here's the following one where they're moving away and appear to have gone below the horizon only because they're going away in distance, where you can see the, both ships without the re bright reflection on them. This is the first picture taken at Ober Sadleg. That means above Sadleg. Taken on the 8th of May of 1975. Uh, when we measured, Meyer estimated that the ship was about over the position of the log pile. And we measured that distance as being 120 yards from the camera position. And the ship slowly approached. He took a series of pictures in this case. There's picture number two you can see that he is standing by an, a, a, an incinerator in a field there to burn field trash. And then after that picture, and it's quite clear here, he rested his elbow on the incinerator. Oh, thank you. Rested the, his, el his elbow on the incinerator to get that picture. Nice, sharp pictures. Now, these, what looks like bushes, the other side of the incinerator here, are full-grown trees down the slope of the hill. There's a steep slope away down here to a river, a creek, and then up the other side to the woods on the other side. And the object is clearly beyond the tops of the trees, which means it's not a small object that's close to the camera. Uh, and it moved along, it's the trajectory here, passed to his left and then turned and started going away towards another tree line. This is about 140 yards away, which is a little bit of an enlargement in the picture there which I did, but you can see in this picture what appears to be a band around the top of the cupola. That, sometimes that's what we saw, he saw. Sometimes it was rectang or rectangular windows with rounded corners like in airliners. And sometimes it, you, you could barely see where the window stopped and the metal of the ship started. So they were different in almost every picture, meaning that he can't use the same model twice because he'd have to be repainting the windows. And also there were other changes. Uh, there was something from the bottom of this, there was a cone that was extended more or less in each of the pictures, in various pictures. And then it turned to the left and moved away across the horizon here. There's another picture of it. This, oh, these were foreground, flowers in the foreground. You can see that they're out of focus. So he, this, this verified the fact that his camera is jammed at infinity and he can only take pictures beyond 35 feet. Anything inside of 35 feet would have been out of focus. So we know that it's beyond 35 feet. 35 feet is far enough away if you have an 18 inch model and you put it in the picture, it'll only be the size of a BB here. And this clearly is not a model. And that is pictures of it going away probably the last one in that series. Now, this uh, starts a new series, and I'm going to pause here for a minute. <coughs> and uh, see if I can get to use this 
little pointer here. <coughs> the uh, the pictures he got in the ash ashram in, in India ten years before this were all in black and white. Now he's using color film. So that's progress of our technology from 64 to 75. So this, these pictures began here at, at that slow approach. Here we can see uh, a power tower and a road in the foreground. He's got a video, a, a, an eight millimeter movie camera set up on a tripod running on automatic, filming the same scene that he's photographing with his hand camera as the ship passes and goes along. Now if you look down here, you'll see that there's a white sandy road running along the side of a field there. And as the ship comes closer, we can see the reflection, well it doesn't show too well here, the reflection of the white sandy road down there in the undersurface of the craft at that, the flange. Now, that couldn't be there if it was a small model near the camera. That has to be a large model some distance from the camera in order for the angle of reflection to, from the road to the camera to be such that you can see it in the bottom of the, sh of the ship at all. And we see that in several of the pictures. Maybe you can see it a little better in here and you can also see the road down there. <coughs> but these were points that, that tended to convince us that these pictures couldn't have been faked, that the pictures were real, the events were real. So we wondered what the Pleiadians were telling him what was going on. And uh, he said that they told him that we, one of their missions here and one of the purposes for being here was that our religions have lost validity over time because of mistranslations and uh, misinterpretations. Each writer putting his own spin on what they started with and then that was spun again by somebody else. And he said that our own religions have lost their original true simplicity by about 80%. And that only about 20% has any relation to validity at all. And this is true not only of the Christian religions, but of other religions as well. So when he revealed this information, uh, all the religions felt themselves under attack all the religions of the world, but not only the religions, but the other isms, communism, socialism, democracy, all of those were bad because they've all been corrupted by men. And the Palladians were, were saying we should get, be getting back to basics. We should know what we believe and why we believe it. And we shouldn't accept anything dogmatically. We shouldn't accept anything because we're told to believe it, because we need to know for ourselves, and until we learn to distinguish and decide for ourselves, we will not grow up. And their mission was to show us our, our law and what we need to recover to get back to basics to proceed with the evolution of our society. And that's basically what the Palladian mission was, was to point out damages that we're inflicting on ourselves by <coughs> environmental th factors that we have accepted. Uh, we eat the wrong foods now. We don't eat pure, pure foods anymore. We process it and we do all kinds of things to it. They said that all of these contribute to the shortness uh, the, of our lifespans. And they said that Earth lifespans were designed to be over a thousand years. And that we have shortened to less than 10% of that. It's not all deliberate and done by us because they explained that <coughs> formerly this planet was sur surrounded by a vapor envelope, something like we see Mars today, a thick vapor envelope, had a lot of water in it. That's when the seas were shallow marshes. We didn't have oceans at the time. We had, had uh, shallow seas. And uh, we had vegetation. It was like a big hothouse of vegetation that grew profusely. And we had the, gra the gigantic animals because of the free availability of vegetation and uh, that our planet moved into a cooler region of space just by a couple of degrees but enough to begin precipitation of the vapor envelope to the surface in the mythical flood and it raised uh, the oceans two and three hundred feet and and produced uh, what we have today a, a water planet with about 
40 percent or 30 percent of the, of the land surface above water. But they said that when the skies cleared, if you, you find this in the Bible too, and they saw blue skies for the first time, that we were exposed to the harsh rays from a particularly harsh sun that reduced the span of all life on the planet by 80 percent, 90 percent. All life had its lifespan reduced by 10 percent. Now this is another reason why we are such a, an attractive uh, point of interest to alien visitors. Often they comment that they are amazed at the extreme variety of life in all species and classes. That this is peculiar, planet is peculiar because of its extreme variety. And others have suggested that the variety comes from the shortened lifespans and the accelerated evolution because of a short lifespan. And, and this may be, may be true, it may be interesting, but we're probably not going to get those lifespans back soon. Anyway, this, uh, that was one of the things that they were pointing out. They are also pointing out that we ne lead, need to learn a, a better relationship with our, what they call the creation. They do not have a personified God. They don't have a personified deity. They have a creation and they, their form of religion is to work in harmony with the creation and this takes the form of gardening, of working metals, of working minerals. We dress them into beautiful gems and stones. It, when we do this, we give some kind of education to those lower forms of what they call life. All, everything is alive. And by working, humanity working with those lower forms, we educate them in some degree. And our mission is to is simply that, is to help evolve the planet. And we're not doing a very good job of it. <coughs> this is a picture was taken over, a, this is a, a, a sanitarium here, and he was invited to bring his camera for a flight demonstration. I think there's only one of these in there, but they, he took 18 pictures in sequence at that time. There's another one, you can barely see it. It's up here in the clouds, so that so clearly removes that from being a model because it's in the vapor of the low cloud scud. If you could, now let me find this. Here we go, someplace here. Right there it is anyway. <laughs> All these modern technology things. Now this is a series of pictures that are taken over, uh, that last one was taken at Winkle Riot, a series of pictures. This one is, ta is from the series taken over Vactyl Hornley. And they arrived this time with three ships a mothership and two drones on the 28th of March, 1976. And uh, they slowly moved up the valley. He had his a movie camera on a tripod. He had his hand camera, the broken Olympus, uh, which took good pictures, but uh, he couldn't control He couldn't make any adjustments on it. And it came slowly up the valley and they circled back and made another approach and then uh, the two drones were sent on high station. They remained up there and the s smaller craft made slow approaches in front of his camera, passing behind vegetation to show that there were trees and bushes between the camera and the craft. Here's uh, two ships. One of, them, one of the drones is now accompanying the mother ship. The second was uh, is above it, out of sight. Here is uh, an interesting one because over here we have the third ship eclipsed by a branch from a local tree that is, is, is out of focus. So we know this is inside of 35 feet and that ship is outside of 35 feet. And the ship is the only thing that's in focus there. Here's another one shows uh, the, the, the third ship approaching an eclipsed position behind the branch. Those two pictures were taken in sequence one right behind the other as Meyer was moving around with his camera stepping back and forth. Here's another image taken at about that time. This is a particularly clear one. Here this is out of focus but you see the, the detail on the ship is quite clearly in focus. <coughs> Here's one taken uh, there at Back to Hornley and this is from a print from the original negative. We took, this is the original negative that we took to Basel to the Hell Chromograph and had them laser scan it and printed it into a poster. 
And when they scanned it and printed it back, here's what we got. Look at the detail on there that comes out. I, that's all that was done to that. There was no other airbrushing, no retouching, nothing. That is nothing but the original 35 millimeter transparency. Wow, how much? Okay. The original transparency uh, printed back on poster paper at 200 dots per inch. So we would like to have done this with a dozen more pictures, but that cost us something like $700 to do that. And it's our own money, and we don't have any other resource. We don't have anybody to help do this, so we, 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 only, we, we only did the one. And we could, here's a comparison of the, a print from the original transparency and a, a, a view of the poster that was printed up. Here's the, the last series of pictures that was taken by Meyer at Hassan Bowl on the 20th of March of 19, 29th of March, 1976. Now, the pictures you saw from Bax of Hornley were taken on the 28th of March, 1976. And the next day, he was invited to come back to another flight demonstration. And this time, they were bringing another new variation. This is variation number four. Here's Meyer's moped. That's his transportation. That's how he gets around. That's all that he has on it is a, uh, this time he had, he was he's carrying some wood in it. But he's, when we, when we were reenacting the photo events and he took me back to every site, <coughs> some of them were hard to get to. We had to go through a locked fence to get to a property that also had a locked fence in the back to go into the field. We had to go across the field on a tractor rock trail and up a steep slope to the shoulder here, looking out over the Fishenthal Valley. Now this valley rolls down thousands of feet. Here's Mount Aruti, shoulder of Mount Aruti disappearing behind the hill there. But there was no way that he could suspend anything in here because there's nothing to suspend it to. And to try to throw it in from the sides, you would you would have to have you'd have to You'd have to have a strong arm to throw it that far to get it in the camera. Now, his pictures flow in sequence, so if you're throwing it in, you have to get it in exactly the correct position each time to show what would be appear to be a, a flow, a flight track. But here's another one. It's slowly approaching. Now it's beginning to take some shape. This started as a small dot in the sky, a small dark dot in the sky. Now it's beginning to take some shape. It's closer still. There's the wood that he's calling, hauling in his moped that day. There you'll, here, here, you'll see on, on that day, there's no rigging gear, there's no poles, no wires, not any other models, nothing there. But his moped and, and a jacket and a little bag of lunch when he went through the gate. And the same farmer unlocked both gates for us when, we, when he took me back there. And I asked the farmer, have you ever seen this man before? He said, yes, I saw him a couple of years ago. He came by here and he wanted to go up on the hill. And I had him describe what he saw. And he said he didn't have anything but his moped and a jacket rolled up and a, what appeared to be a sack of lunch. He didn't have any anything in the back at that time. There was no box on the stand. And so he, we had an eyewitness to his approach to the scene to take the picture and his return a couple hours later. And the same thing at the Baxel Hornley site was something very similar. We had to go through a, a barnyard with a bunch of cows in it that he had to go through. This uh, moved to the right, left to right. There's Mount Alrudi again. Here's a, a uh, tripod with a magnetic detector on it this time. Somebody had given him a magnetic detector and find out if it has any, is emanating any field. And it's moving now from left to right across the scene getting closer. Here's vegetation in the foreground. Passing beyond another bush. Now the ship is moving from left to right and Meyer's walking from left to right also like this, following it. And the bushes is apparently passing between them and going out to the left, as you see here. Here we caught it in beyond the branches of a uh, tree that uh, made a beautiful picture. We can see the color fully. It's, 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 it's quite colorful. Here is, he's approaching, the ship now is approaching these two trees down here. And it's sl slowly descending and comes down to beyond the first tree. And here we see 
the craft illuminated by sun's rays reflected from the dome, the cupola of the craft, and you see the two beams of light coming down from that. Those are called crepuscular rays. They're like a rainbow. They're only formed at a distance. You can't get up, can't catch up to them, and they're not there if you're close enough to the ship. That's another reason why, a piece of evidence why the ship is distant. It, it, you couldn't get the crepuscular rays from a model close to the lens. Here's a better picture of the same thing. We have about five pictures in sequence that show it behind the tree. We only published one, and that's the one that everybody attacked and said that it was inside of the tree, which it clearly is not. And here is me standing under the same tree in the different time of the year when it's leafed out. And that's, uh, I'm right under the tree. The ship was some distance beyond the tree and Ketzel beamed down from the ship to some point about where I'm standing where he talked to Meyer for 20 minutes and then the ship departed and left. Now on the 7th of July of 1976, Meyer was picked up by Semyasi, she brought the, her craft in with an empty seat and a suit for Meyer. And they picked him up and they took him. They had told him before this to be ready. They'd invite him to, to go on a trip with him to be ready to be gone five days. Well, all he did was ride his moped to the scene. He's, he's that kind of person. He doesn't pack a big lunch and things like that. He just met her there. And they flew out towards the mothership. And as they're approaching the mothership, a giant spherical mothership, 10 miles in diameter. There was another flight of ships that came in from the distance in the dark sky, and one of them separated and started passing between, heading for, towards the mothership ahead of them. And as it got closer to the mothership, it did a somersault in the sky, and Meyer happened to snap it at that point. It was surrounded by a radiant field of light Here's a second one and a third one coming into the scene here the same way. And these entered an open port in the mothership before Semyasi and Meyer did. Now, when he got in the, when he got in the mothership, he was uh, amazed after the, the airlock closed behind him. He was amazed to see other craft of the variations, the kinds that he had seen, but other variations that he had never seen before lined up in rows that ran out of sight on the hangar floor and the deck that he was in. And he, he remarked on the number of ships. He said, what do you do with all of these ships? There's thousands of them there. He said, well, we may have as many as 500 of them out of the mothership at any given time. Now, that's a lot of activity. And they're all doing things in re with respect to your planet and other neighboring planets. Now, this picture was taken at uh, uh, Fuchsbull Hofhalden. And this picture was challenged by a lot of people saying this is wired into the tree, it's a model tree, and it's wired into the tree. Of course, you can see the base here, so if it was a model tree, we would see the tub it's sitting in. But here is another tree, similar tree, to the right of Meyer, and it's in the foreground. It's clearly out of focus, and everything over here is in focus. So this is clearly beyond the branches of the other tree. From Meyer's camera position about here, he walked down to the left, and then came across to the right as he snapped pictures of that ship slowly circling the tree there that you see. And it, it went around it twice. And here it is behind the top going around the back. Now the tree is clearly between the camera and the ship here. And von Kavitsky says that, that, uh, that those pictures were all hoaxed with a model on a fish line suspended around a model tree. <coughs> now, that tree disappeared. And... There was a lot of controversy, and even in Meyer's group about this, because only three people besides Meyer had seen the tree. Hans uh, Schutzbach and uh, Engelbert Wechter had seen the tree before it, had, before it disappeared. And they had seen it shortly before it disappeared, and they remarked that the top of the tree was turning brown in the vicinity where the craft circled it. Then the next time they went back to take pictures of it, the tree was gone. And uh, this caused some dissension in Meyer's group. Only the ones that saw, that saw the tree didn't, weren't sure that he had taken pictures there because they didn't see him take the pictures. And the one that didn't see the pictures, I mean the, the tree or the place afterwards, thought 
how can a tree disappear? Simply disappear. And they didn't believe that. However, there was down here on the ground, there's a, there's a field that goes, slopes down to the water there. That's the Papaker Sea behind that. And it's a field that a farmer grew something, some crop in like uh, soybeans or alfalfa or something like that. And he had plowed around the tree for years. And when the tree disappeared, there was no evidence that the tree had ever been there. There was no stump, no root, no hole in the ground, nothing. It was just gone. And when Meyer asked Demyasi about what happened to it, she said, we changed its time. And so the tree no longer had any existence there, but the land that the tree stood on is there, and the farmer had been plowing around it for years, and even afterwards you could find the island that he plowed, or plowed around for a long time. <clears throat> so there was a lot of dissension in Meyer's group about disappearing trees. And Samyasi finally offered to put on a demonstration of this. So they went out to the Preck Nature Preserve on a Sunday afternoon picnic. Meyer took everybody that didn't believe in the tree story. And they prepared a picnic lunch and they took some uh, garment bags from a, a, a laundry, uh, cross sticks in the bottom and lighted rags dipped in kerosene to get heat and they made air balloons that they were floating them away. And one of them with a little bit too much gasoline on the wick got going higher than they thought it should and the men started running after it, then the kids, then the women. They thought they, they knew they had to get it before it landed or could start a fire. When they arrived at the picnic ground though, however, Meyer had told, been told to have them take pictures. So he told everybody that had cameras, they all brought cameras, to take pictures all around where they were. And after they chased the balloon, even the women left the scene, and when they finally got back, Meyer was told to tell them to all take pictures of the same place again, so they all took pictures a second time. And uh, let's see if I can get this in the right order here. There was a, there were two trees in the first picture standing here, a, a bigger one about twice as tall as this one, and you can see that this one was growing away from the taller tree. And the taller tree is now gone, but it's still growing away from it. And when they examined the ground, there's no evidence here that the taller tree ever stood there. Now, all of the dissenting witnesses in, in Meyer's group were there. All those that didn't believe the story of the missing tree now have seen one disappear, or the evidence of it. And here, you can see the two trees together. Here's the smaller one. Well, this, it's gone here, too. There was, the bigger tree was back here. And I thought I had the right slide in there, but this, that's my mistake. That's, you can see that was still leaning it away from where it was, and there's no evidence the other tree grew there. <coughs> so I was there several times when Meyer had contact, and I was never able to get into contact, but I was able to go back to him to the contact site within an hour after the contact took place. In this case, Semyasi and Kessel arrived in separately in two ships. One landed here and one over there. And Meyer came, this was at two o'clock in the morning and Meyer was back by six o'clock. I was up and he told me that he just had a contact and he was going to go back and photograph the site. So I went with him and he took these pictures. These are typical landing tracks. There were dozens of these that uh, Hans Schutzbach had recorded and photographed and Meyer himself. And uh, there were the, the, the only tracks out of this landing site was right here where Semyasi walked into the woods and stood under the trees and talked to Meyer and then walked back to the ship and got in it. No other tracks in the grass. It's tall grass and wet grass too. They would be there. There were no tracks around that other one. So those that say that Meyer made the tracks with devices or a stick or something else would have to explain to me how he could jump into that spot to make the picture jump out again without leaving any tracks. Here's Meyer standing there with his camera preparing to take a picture of the same track. Now you can see where he's standing. He's trampled the grass down. Here's what a track in the snow in the, in the wintertime looks like. This is not one of Semyasi's ships. This is a track made by a ship flown by Menara, another alien extraterrestrial from another society that was working in some close relationship with the Pleiadians and was her craft was being housed aboard the mothership while she was working in that capacity. But the interesting thing I found here, this I took this picture, 
is the, the ice, snow and ice is about four inches deep here, and the sides were perfectly vertical, just like you cut it with a knife all the way around, and the center plate was melted out. That's the water that had refrozen the ice in the center point. The dog wouldn't, he'd, he'd go around the edge of the track, but he wouldn't go into the track at all. He'd just sniff the edge and run. Here's a, a picture taken from a recent series, and this is, Mo, is Meyer's little uh, utility vehicle, and he's towing a power generator behind it. And uh, both the battery and the uti utility vehicle and the power generator went completely dead while this was hovering. This Quetzal is in that ship. And Quetzal flew off, and Meyer said, you've destroyed my vehicle. Quetzal came back. He said, I'll help you fix it. So Kessel got out, and they worked on it for a bit. Some people entered the, the area there. Kessel got a warning from his ship, got it back in it, flew away again, waited until the people left. Then he came back again to help Meyer get the, car, the, the vehicle started, and he brought some device from aboard that they used to start the vehicle so it could recharge the generator so the generator could run. And then he left, and Meyer went on home. Now, this, we've been... A lot of people say that this is a model, the construction that that somebody made up or that Meyer made up. Now, there's nobody on the farm ever saw the model, and there's 18 people that live on the farm with him. Nobody ever saw anything like this around the farm, and it's not a, just a simple shape as you see there. Here's a picture taken at night, if I can get it up here, of the bottom of the craft. Look at how complex it is, and each of these red lights were separately illuminated and they blinked in different sequences. The bottom glowed as though it was illuminated from in, an interior like it was semi-transparent. Also glowed up here. Uh, it would be a highly complex model for anybody to construct just to fool somebody with a picture. <coughs> so that's the slides. <coughs>